All right. How's everybody doing today? Pretty good. People are still coming in. <laughs> Let's see. Wait a little bit longer here. All right, it's good to see everybody here today. And I don't know if y'all saw, but Miss Midge is here with us. So let's clap for her, yeah, and for her health, being able to come to come here, you know. Um, ha- yeah, well, we're going to have to get you back on the, on the stage soon, as soon as you're able. All right. <laughs> All right, praise God. Well... And Miss Carrie. Oh, that's all right. Yep, it's and the surgery's already completed. Oh man. Yeah. Well, that's good that you're through it. <coughs> Why don't we uh bow our heads and bow our hearts and open up with a word of prayer? <coughs> Dear Lord, thank you again. Um thank you that every week we can meet here and gather together in fellowship and in our unity of our worship and our reverence for you, Lord. Um, We pray that uh, we continue, you allow us to continue to be able to do so and that we can continue to grow uh, both in our knowledge of your word and in just the the way that you've set us apart, Lord, that you can keep continue teaching us and um, sanctifying us, Lord. I pray that uh, you open our hearts and allow us to receive the message that you have for us. And I pray, like I like I always do, that you don't allow me to get in the way of your teaching, Lord. And um, we pray that your will be done tonight. And in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, so Pastor Derek uh, is having me fill in this week for him. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be speaking on Elijah. I think he's at Summerfest. Is that what it is? Um, helping out with uh, another church, right? I was just, he's just having a, oh, Parks and Rec. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sure we'll get an update from him. All right, so we finished last week with Solomon's death. And really the next great figure that you come along, you come across in the Bible is Elijah. Elijah is an even more magnifying person than Solomon. You know, and a lot of people are like, how can someone follow up, you know, the wisest man of all time? Well, you're going to see here tonight. Um, The next king of the throne after Solomon was his son, Rehoboam. And just like David wasn't the best father or family man for Solomon, it is a characteristic that carried on and echoed through Solomon's fatherhood. He didn't bestow the wisdom he had onto his heir to the throne. So Rehoboam was not a wise man. And when all Israel had assembled to make him the next king, the people made an inquiry of Rehoboam. And let's read that in 1 Kings (coughs) 12.4. Your father made our yoke hard, but now lighten the hard labor imposed by your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam asked the crowd for three days so he can think about it, which is kind of a wise thing to do, right? But during this time, he goes and consults with the elders that had served under King Solomon and asks what they think he should do. And you think it's a no-brainer. This group of elders served with the wisest man of all time. Um, you would think that they'd have some accurate counsel. Um, and they tell him, if you help the people, give them what they want this time, they will be yours forever. You know? And Rehoboam didn't like this counsel. 
He refused it. Instead, he goes to some young men that are his own age. It says in the Bible, men that he grew up with. He's going to his buddies. And they tell him basically to act like a tyrant king. They say to tell the people where his father would discipline, let them know you're going to scourge them with, with your discipline. Where the father made his yoke heavy on you, tell, tell the people that you're going to add to their labor, that you're going to add to, the, to their load. And of course, this does not carry over well. He follows the advice of the young men his age rather than the elders that were under his, his father. And this causes the kingdom to divide into two kingdoms. So after Solomon, it splits into two here. You have the northern kingdom, which is Israel. It keeps the name Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. And this happened around 930 B.C. is um, the kingdom split. The northern kingdom, Israel, consisted of ten of the tribes. It was headquartered in Samaria. In 722 B.C., it falls to the Syrian Empire. And about a half, a century and a half later, the southern kingdom, Judah, is captured by the Babylonian Empire. And we see all that happens with uh, in the book of Daniel um, during the Babylonian period of them ruling and taking captives and everything that happens with that. But Israel up north has 20 kings total. The northern kingdom has 20 kings total, and every single one of them is evil. Meanwhile, there are also a succession of 20 rulers in the southern kingdom. Um, you ladies might like this because one of the 20 is a queen. You know, there's 19 kings, one queen in the southern kingdom. But the one queen is wicked, so um, it's not really something to be proud of. But we repeatedly see the pattern during this time of God warning them, they don't listen, and then God punishing them or, or judging them. And it brings to mind what I've said before, probably a couple months ago now, that sin can be forgiven in an instant by God, but the consequences of the sin that you've committed can last a lifetime. <clears throat> For me personally, I know God would have used me to a higher capacity if I would have obeyed him earlier in my life, but my sin has been forgiven, of course, and I can rejoice in that. I still have to humbly accept the consequences of things I've done in the past. So there's a difference there that we have to realize. We can also rejoice in that we don't have to have any more consequences of sin in our life if we continue being fully devoted to God. Now, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 12 all the way through chapter 17, it's, a, it's describing this succession of kings um, within those two kingdoms, the north and the south. Most of these kings, like I said, they worship pagan gods, and they're, they're evil. Um, there are two who were God-fearing, but for the most part, they were all wicked, both of the 20 kings in the north and the 20 rulers in the south. The Bible really starts to focus and hone in when we reach King Ahab in 1 Kings 16.30. Uh, so let's go ahead and start reading there. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Of all the kings, this guy was the most evil. First Kings 16.31 And as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal at the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah, so Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Of course, God was ready for this and has a man of his own to respond to what King Ahab was doing. And this is where we first hear of Elijah. The Bible doesn't get into Elijah's beginnings so much, but chapter 17 just jumps right in. Verse 1, we read, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall certainly be neither um, dew nor rain during these years except by my word. So Elijah announces a drought on the land. And we find in the New Testament, this drought is three and a half years long. Let's go ahead and read in Luke 4, 25. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up 
for three years and six months when a severe famine came over all the land. We have Jesus testifying to it there. And then we have James in James 5.17 say, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. So we have two witnesses here, or two accounts, that the drought was three and a half years. This is going to be important later, because we're going to get into a little bit of uh, prophecy that the Bible reveals to us. <coughs> and um, the more seriously we take the studying the Scripture, the point of this is the more seriously we take the studying the Scripture, the more that gets revealed to us, and the stronger our faith becomes. And the more our faith grows, the more courageous we are at witnessing to unsaved people in our lives. <coughs> so let's keep this in mind. Elijah sent a drought for three and a half years. Uh, chapters 17 through 22 show the tension between the wicked king Ahab and the prophet of God, Elijah. Chapter 18, 17, we read, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, the cause of disaster to Israel? Ahab isn't concerned with why the judgment was happening of that drought. He just starts off the conversation with hostility towards the prophet of God. And we see, that, we see this um, characteristic in wicked people. Now let's read Proverbs. Uh, actually, I, didn't, I skipped this one. Um, but Ahab saw Elijah as the problem. He didn't look inside his own heart to see the source of the problem. Rather, in his eyes, God's prophet was the problem. The consequences of his actions were the problem. But he wanted to be able to do what he wanted with no consequences. <coughs> and Elijah responds to King Ahab in verse 18. He said, I have not brought disaster to Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. Remember, Baal was a god of rain. So this was a humiliation of their, the god they're worshiping for three and a half years. Their sacrifices to Baal to receive rain did nothing. Um, and this was also to demonstrate who the real God was, the God they were supposed to be worshiping and the God that actually has power. <coughs> and to make it even more apparent, Elijah challenges King Ahab, and he says in verse 19, Now then, send orders and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. A prophet is supposed to be someone who speaks on behalf of God and also is someone who calls people out on their idolatry. Let's read on. So Ahab sent orders among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long are you going to struggle with the two choices? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him so much as a word. <clears throat> then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left as a prophet of the Lord, while Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now have them give us two oxen and have them choose the one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people replied, that is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose the one ox for yourselves and prepare it first. He's giving them the choice. You, you pick the one you guys want. Since there are many of you, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under the ox. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped about the altar which they had made. And at noon, Elijah ridiculed them and said, Call out with a loud voice, since he is a god. Undoubtedly, he is attending to business, or is on the way, or he's on a journey. Perhaps he is asleep and will awaken. So he's taunting them now. He's having, he's, I'm sure he was enjoying this. Um, you got to love Elijah and the way he's mocking them here. Um, he knows that there's no God that's going to answer them. 
but egging them on makes them try even harder. So they cried out with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. These prophets of Baal were out there for hours and hours, cutting themselves, flailing about, going crazy. And then Elijah says it's his turn. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come forward to me. So all the people came forward to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Then Elijah took 12 stones corresponding to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he laid out the wood, and he cut the ox in pieces and placed it on the wood. And he said, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. He's so confident in God, he knows God's going to follow through. He's soaking the wood on the altar with water. And there's no, you know, then there can be no accusation. He's trying, he tried some kind of trickery. And he said, do it a second time. So they did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. So they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. He's just making sure it's just completely soaked. Then at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook, Kishon, and slaughtered them there. And this leads us right into the next chapter. (coughs) Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And you, you want to think like, man, Elijah is just, he's a man of God. He's courageous and brave. But then we read in verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more so if by about this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the life of one of them. And he was afraid and got up and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. <coughs> that's, that's what's crazy to me, is how after performing these miracles, and while knowing he's a prophet of God, Elijah was scared for his life by this threat. But that is what we know of God. Like he often likes to use people that are weak among us, and people that wouldn't be so necessarily courageous and brave and confident. He uses courageous people as well. But with his prophets, you know, like with Moses, how Moses was really humble and he kept telling God, use somebody else, you know. Um, It's interesting in his choice of prophets. But Elijah was also very overwhelmed. And we read in verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked for himself to die and said, Enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He knows the moment that he is in, it's too big for him, and he's, he's kind of just wiped out, overwhelmed from, from everything that went on, and he's kind of just had it. So God helps him through it. The angel of the Lord appears to Elijah and provides food for him. Elijah goes back to sleep, and then a second time the angel of the Lord appears, wakes him up, gives him food again, and tells Elijah he has a long journey ahead of him. Verse 8 even says Elijah was able to travel for 40 days and 40 nights off the strength of that food. That's pretty amazing. He ends up in a cave and is still disheartened. So the word of the Lord asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah responds in verse 10, 1 Kings 19.10, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, for the sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant 
torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they have sought to take my life. So God decides to encourage Elijah by reminding him of his power. God gives Elijah a personal demonstration of his power. Verse 11. So he said, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. Just imagine God does that, sets you on a mountain, and you witness an entire horizon of mountains just being torn apart by the wind. <coughs> That's pretty humbling, but also encouraging if you're in Elijah's position. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah responds with the same answer, but I suspect it's with a little less conviction after witnessing all that. Um, God tells him to go down to Damascus and anoint Hazael king over Aram and Jehu king over Israel and Elisha as a prophet in his place. So he goes and finds Elisha. Elisha is plowing with oxen. He's doing farm work, which was basically hard labor back then, especially in those days. Farm work nowadays is, is hard labor, but back then it was a whole other level. So Elisha jumps at the chance to serve the Lord, and he begins to serve under Elijah. <coughs> Chapter 21 has King Ahab coveting his neighbor's vineyard. Uh, his asks his neighbor for it. He'll trade it for an equal, a vineyard of equal value or greater, but his neighbor won't give it to him. So he, lets, he tells his wife about it, Jezebel. Jezebel ends up taking the king's seal, writing letters in his name, sealing it, sending it to elders in the city that his neighbor Naboth lives in, telling, him to sit, telling them to sit him, throw a feast, sit Naboth as in the seat of honor, and put two worthless people next to him to be false witnesses. And they accuse him in front of everybody at this feast of cursing God and cursing the king. So the people drag him out of the feast and stone him to death. And Ahab then is free to claim that vineyard for himself. That's just displaying the wickedness of the king at that time. And then we read in 1 Kings 21, 17, the response to this. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, this is what the Lord says. Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him saying, The Lord says this, In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs will lick up your blood, yours as well. Then Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, enemy of mine? There's that character trait of a wicked person again. They don't look inward at what they've done. They look outward at the consequence and get angry at that. It's mind-boggling. You know, to be wicked in this way is actually to be a coward because it takes courage to look within yourself and see what is wrong, to see the sin that was guiding your actions, to, to face it, and then make that correction inside yourself. And we're all capable of doing this because we have the Holy Spirit to continue the work within us. We're not supposed to be lazy about it, we need to put effort into our growth, and God will, re will re reward that. Excuse me. God rewards the diligent. Let's continue. And he answered, I have found you, Elijah is responding to King Ahab, I have found you because you have given yourself over to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I am bringing disaster upon you, and I will utter utterly sweep you away and will eliminate from Ahab every male both bond and free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Bashar, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger, and because you have misled Israel in his sin. The Lord has also spoken of Jezebel, saying, The dogs will eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel. 
The one belonging to Ahab, who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. The one who dies in the field, the birds of the sky will eat. There certainly was no one like Ahab who gave himself over to do evil in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. He also acted very despicably in following idols, conforming to everything that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord drove out from the sons of Israel. Yet it came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted, and he lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days. I will bring the disaster upon his house in his son's days. Now here we're seeing how quickly and instantly God is willing to forgive if you're truly repentant. But simultaneously, the heavy consequence is still there. It's not going away. <clears throat> Let's uh, skip to chapter 22, verse 40. So Ahab lay down with his fathers, and his son Ahaziah became king in his place. <clears throat> Ahaziah followed in his father's footsteps. Verse uh, 53. So he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger, according to all that his father had done. <clears throat> in 2 Kings 1, 2, we read, And Ahaziah fell through the window lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. So he, went, so he sent messengers and said to them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? When the messengers returned to Ahaziah, he said to them, Why have you returned? They said to him, A man came up to meet us and said to us, Go return to the king who sent you and say to him, This is what the Lord says. It is because there is no God in, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore you will not get down from the bed upon which you have lain, but you shall certainly die. Then he said to him, What did the man look like who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? And they said to him, He was a hairy man, with a leather belt worn around his waist, and he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So let's, let's pay attention to what this king is going to do. He, no, he got a prophecy from a prophet of God, and this is his response. He gets a captain with 50 men, and he went up to him, and behold, he was sitting on the top of the hill. And he said to him, you man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah replied to the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, May fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So King Ahaziah, his response to fire falling from heaven, burning his men up, is I'm going to send another 50 men to go get him. <clears throat> and then Elijah sends fire down from heaven again, wipes them out again. And <laughs> it's... And, you would think now, okay, now the second time he's going to learn his lesson, right? But we read in uh, verse 13. So the king again sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50 men. When the third captain of the 50 went up, and now this captain has to do what the king says or the king will kill him, you know. So he shows up. He came and bowed down on his knees before Elijah. <laughs> he knows what happened to the last two. He begged him and said to him, you man of God, Please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of 50 with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he got up and went down with him to the king. Elijah then tells the king in person the same thing he told his messengers, that he would die in his bed of sickness, and he did. <coughs> As simple as that. The next event in Elijah's life, in my opinion, is the most fascinating. Uh, 2 Kings 2, 1. Now it came about when the Lord was about to bring Elijah up by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah left Gilgal with Elisha. And Elijah said to Elisha, 
Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. And this pattern repeats. When they, when they get there, the sons of the prophets of Bethel come and tell Elisha, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And Elisha responds, yes, I know. Be still. You know, like, leave me alone. I know. And they, they continue to go. Elijah set, tells them, don't follow him. Elisha says, I'm going to follow you. And, it, it, and then prophets of God come and say, hey, do you know he's being taken? And it just, it, this repeats. And then we read in uh, 2 Kings 2, 7. Now 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan and Elijah took his coat, folded it and struck the waters and they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask me what I should do for you before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And as they were walking along and talking, behold, a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, and they separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven, and Elisha was watching it, and he was crying out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he did not see Elijah again. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. This is fascinating scripture right here. We have a prophet who was taken up by God. He's raptured up. I have a question for you all, and it should be an easy answer by now. How many rapture events do you think are in the Bible? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Chad? <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> so... No, no, it's seven. Yep, seven. There's that number seven again. So we have Enoch. I'm just going to go through it real quick. Enoch in Genesis 5, 42. He's raptured up. And also Hebrews 11, 5 um, mentions, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. Elijah here in 2 Kings, we have him raptured up. Jesus, of course, in the Ascension, Mark 16, 19. <clears throat> also, um, it talks about Jesus, his Ascension in Acts 1, 9 through 11 and Revelation 12, 5. Philip in Acts 8, through, or 8, 39, it says, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4 he, it says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And then, of course, the body of Christ, the rapture we always talk about, First Thessalonians 4, 17, and that's six, right? We have Enoch, Elijah, Jesus, Philip, Paul, the body of Christ, or the church, and then John in Revelation 4, 1 through 2. <coughs> So, seven. But we're running out of time here, but there is something I want to get into really quickly. In the New Testament, when John the Baptist was in the wilderness, he was making such a commotion that the Jewish priests sent an inquiry about him, and we get an insight into who they believe is coming based on Old Testament prophecy. Let's read John 1.20 real quick. And he confessed, this is John the Baptist talking, and he confessed and did not deny. And this is what he confessed. I am not the Christ. And so they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. So that's three different figures that the Jews are looking for to be coming. Those are who they believe they, that are coming. The Messiah, Elijah, and the prophet, most people believe the prophet is Moses. Where do they get this idea from? Well, it's in Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before what? Before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. We know that as the second coming, which hasn't happened yet. Let's, and then 
it talks about the prophet that we believe is Moses, or at least I do, in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. And we see in the New Testament, it's not done with Elijah. Luke 9, 30 through 31. Let's read that real quick. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different. This is talking of Christ. And his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. Matthew 17, 3 through 5. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter responded and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter always seems to be putting his foot in his mouth. But what did Moses and Elijah witness here? They witnessed God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then, that's, that's the transfiguration. Let's really quickly bridge it with Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. The resurrection um, at Luke 24, 2 through 5. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two angels? No, two men. We have a habit of assuming they're angels. But it says, two men suddenly stood near them in gleaming clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why are you seeking the living one among the dead? So there's two witnesses to his resurrection there, and they're men. Now, let's go to Acts 1, 9 through 11, talking of Jesus' Jesus's ascension. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Again, two men witnessing the ascension. This is really compelling. Let's continue with what is going to happen in the future regarding two witnesses. Where, where do we see two witnesses? Revelation, Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. We've got to get specific with the Bible. The Bible counts years in 360 days. 300, so three and a half years, if you multiply time, you know, you get 1,260 days. 300, you multiply 360 days times three and a half, which is the years, you get 1,260, right? Which is the same amount of a, the same time that Elijah did the drought. That's why I said to remember that. Revelation 11.5, and this is, this is the ending passage right here. So thank you guys for your patience. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And so if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. So here you have no rain falling for three and a half years, which is the, the time of their prophesying, and using fire to consume enemies of God. Sounds an awful lot like Elijah, right? And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. And you all remember when we talked about Moses, he turned the Nile into blood. And to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Everyone remembers, everyone, without e us even talking about Moses, we know the ten plagues of Moses. When they have finished their testimony, and they're witnessing at the most darkest time in human history, you have the Antichrist ruling the world at this point, right? And you, so what's appropriate? Two witnesses that actually witnessed each moment that's crucial to the Christian faith, right? The most crucial events of the Christian faith all deal with Jesus Christ's death, burial, resurrection, his ascension. So it would make sense that the Bible would have that there. At each of those spots, two men as witnesses. <clears throat> so when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. 
But it's not until they finish their testimony, that their mission that God gave them. Their dead bodies will lie on the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which also their Lord was crucified. Those from the people's tribes, languages, and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who live on the earth will rejoice <coughs> because, remember, the wicked, the consequence, they, they are not looking inward, they're looking outward at the consequences that they were suffering from. They'll, they're going to celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who live on the earth. And after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to he into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. So... We're going we're gonna to go ahead and stop there. I went over on time, so we don't have to do Q&A, um, or at least not as many Q&As, because I kind of ate into that time, and I apologize. But I really wanted to run home, the, like bring it all into one, you know, and that conclusion. But do we have any...